Let the truth be told. Welcome to the weekly call for the Republic for the United States of America. My name is Kelby. Today is Wednesday, August 17, 2011. This is an introduction call for the people of that all capital letter corporation called the United States. Its employees, law enforcement, armed services, and especially the 14th Amendment citizens. Special thank you to the women, excuse me, men and women of our armed services. We love you and we appreciate what you do for our country. The Republic government, called the Republic for the United States of America, has been re-inhabited. Those are big words. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans that simply found some truths, and now we are sharing these important truths with the rest of the world. Get ready to hear things that sound impossible. Get ready to understand that you're about to be a part of history. I welcome each one of you to the Republic for the United States of America. And as we go on to this call, I request that you grab your pen and your piece of paper, because tonight we're going to learn. And I respectfully request that you search out and look into every single thing that we are saying so that you too can discover the truth and at a whim be able to share them with others. But before we get started on tonight's call, I'd like to ask Mr. Robert Ruel to please open us up in prayer. Uh, Robert, you have the floor. Thank you, Kelby. It's an honor to be here with you. And uh, I'm just honored to be involved in what God is doing in the Republic. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in the Republic. Right now I pray for all 50 republics. We pray for unity. We pray that your will will be done. Lord, we thank you that you are building this republic, that you are drawing people into it. And we come against the enemy who would like to bring division. Father, we lift up each person in, in leadership, all the senators, Congress, and our president, that they would have wisdom and strength to continue on as we continue to build this republic. Lord, I just thank you that integrity is the earmark of this republic. Lord, we just thank you that your spirit is moving between us to bring unity. We come against division, and we thank you that your will be done as we rebuild this republic. Father, we glorify you for all that you've done, and I pray for each and every person out there listening that their ears would be open to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Robert, thank you for uh, saying that prayer for Republic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being on the call. The playback number for this call is 424-203-8099. And the code is 819054. You'll be able to play that recording at any time until the next Wednesday call. This call will also be posted this evening on the Republic for the United States dot org. So you can play it at any time on a live stream. For some quick announcements, remember that there are new calls on Thursdays and Sundays. Mr. Robert Zuluaga heads up the Thursday night call. It is a uh, Republic roundtable where you get to know the leaders in the Republic. We encourage you to be a part of that call. Uh, you can get the numbers and the information on the bottom of the Republic website, which is, again, republicfortheunitedstates.org, and or you can simply dial 712-432-0075. Participant code is 851350. Zero. Remember that this is a call for training new people. I'm going to do a review of the July 20th and July 27th calls, the last two calls that I have done, and talk about some more history at the end of the review. Please remember the key words, key words in life, contracts, things you sign. When a word is applied in a contract, it is a contract or document and that writer's intent on what that word means. It is very important that we ask and talk about words. The reason is we have many, many words that have multiple definitions and we need to be clear about what they mean before we attach our signatures to them. Example, the definition of de facto. It means existing in fact, whether legally recognized. In other words, not by right or not by law. That is what we consider the existing United States government located in the Washington, D.C. They are de facto. They have no right, and they're not there by law. And we'll explain that. Okay. Let's talk about time frames.
programs again what we did last month it's to be more specific refer to the republic for the united states dot org and click on weekly calls and review the july twentieth and twenty seventh calls so that you can get more in depth on this historic uh, history period between seventeen seventy six and nineteen forty four remember in seventeen seventy six the original united states and the Declaration of Independence was formed. It was a collection of sovereign republics in the Union. Before I go on to one more thing, I want to remind everybody on the call, what I'm about to say is uncontestable. It is absolute in the law, and we will quote you those laws, and we will show you what you need to verify and validate what we are saying. The next year we're going to talk about is something very interesting. I've always been perplexed by this and I don't understand it. Here we are listening to the Declaration of Independence being read uh, on the Super Bowl event of last year. It was actually this year. That Super Bowl event played out the Declaration of Independence and it had Colin Powell and it talked about all these things about how we stood up to the tyranny of Great Britain and the king. Now, I want you to understand something. In 1783, a treaty of Paris was formed, and this is where we received monies as a loan from the king of France. So I'm going to read you the opening paragraph of the Treaty of Paris. This is important. It, having pleased the divine providence to dispose the hearts of the most serene and most potent Prince George III, by grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. Okay, wait a minute. Let's stop right there. The opening line for the Treaty of Paris is saying the people that loaned us the money, the King of France, is really the King of Britain the King of England. I don't understand that, but if somebody does, please let me know. Because I don't understand why it is the King of Great Britain, which is the King of England, who we were at war against at the time, who we made a declaration of independence against. Why is he loaning us money under the auspices of the Treaty of Paris? Now, would have these gentlemen been able to make this public and shown this information back to the whole world at that time? No. Most people didn't even see the Declaration of Independence by this time. They were just proud Americans that took a stand. So yet, the King of Britain, France, Ireland, Defender of the Faith, Duke of Brunswick and Lundberg, here's the interesting one, Arch Treasurer and Prince of the Elector of the Holy Roman Empire. It's mentioning something about the Holy Roman Empire. Now, that could be the Roman Empire. It could be the Vatican, which did not exist at that time, or the Catholic faith. So here we have a king who is the arch-treasurer and prince-elector of the Holy Roman Empire. Guys, we have a lot of studying that we have to do as a newly re-inhabited republic. We need to understand truly what happened and why it is we are in the position that we're in. So, again, in 1860, we're going to jump up about 50 years, 60 years, the last original Congress adjourned. Let me go into that just real briefly. Seven southern states did not want to be taxed. That's what was the real deal. They didn't want to go through taxation. They left Congress. What happened at that time in 1860, it means the ability for the president to have a quorum in Congress was gone. So, 1861, war was declared on the southern states by the mere fact that they used slavery as the motive and told the northern states to get the support. Hey, come and help us with these southern states who are not allowing for freedom to happen for the people of America. That was the auspices of the reason for going to war. 1861, national emergency and martial law was declared. Habeas corpus was suspended. In 1863, General Order 100, known as the Lieber Code, better known as the First Executive Order, was introduced. 
I'm going to ask you guys again to Google General Orders 100, the book. There's a book. And it completely talks about nothing but martial law. Now, martial law, as we know, has been in effect since this period of time. I will go into that later. And I will go into proofs. Because now, for the first time in history, because Abraham Lincoln did not have a quorum, he had to act as if. He basically wrote a letter to the field, Field Order 100, the field, the people in the field, the generals. Hey, this is what we got to do. We don't have a choice. We don't have a quorum. We got to go forward. Those people instituted and followed those unlawful orders. That's what they were, because they didn't have a quorum. So basically, it was a civil war, a declaration of war against the southern states. Now, in 1865, the capital moved. The capital was moved to Washington, D.C. It's a separate country. It's not a part of the United States of America. Does that sound crazy? It does to me. But I know when you're talking about the 50 states, you're not talking about the District of Columbia. Some people actually think the District of Columbia is just a city within the Maryland. Let's get clear about that right now. In 1871, the Act, it's better known as the Act of the District of Columbia, or Act of 1871, a corporation was formed, a municipal body, and a 10-square-mile area was given, and it was called the District of Columbia. Now, the, now, on February 21st of 1871, a corporation was formed, and it was called the United States. Now, listen. That's in Title 28, Section 302, Number 15A. United States means it's a federal corporation. The location of the United States, that federal corporation, I thought the United States was a body of people. Well, the location of the United States, better known as a federal corporation, is in the District of Columbia. UCC 9307H states the location of the United States is located in the District of Columbia. What does Columbia mean? Remember what we said, the intent of words. It's by who makes up those words. Well, Columbia, one of the meanings, meanings of Columbia is goddess of death and destruction. Now, that gets interesting. So, I've heard all this. I've heard it before. I'm not really interested because maybe they just formed a corporation for our benefit. And maybe they just wanted to put it in the district of goddess of death and destruction, I mean Columbia, because they wanted to protect it. And, and we have to protect it in its own sovereign territory. Okay, let's, we're okay. I'm okay. Now I'm an outsider listening to Kelby talk. I'm okay. I'm hearing that it was a corporation. It was formed. No big deal. What's the big deal? Well, let's talk about that. The original constitutional government was vacated. This is huge. The lawful de jure original constitutional government was vacated and a corporation was formed. And they didn't do anything about taking on the same Constitution Bill of Rights that we have. Now, I'm going to prove to you something. People have gone today, have had another radio interview today. They went and looked at House.gov. House.gov is the de facto website for Congress. This is where they go and get their laws from. So when they go and look at their own congressional archives, the Constitution, to see what laws they must adhere to or apply to the American people, what they are showing on their own Constitution, these amendments, like the 14th Amendment, it's actually called an article. We refer to them as amendments, but it's really called an article. That 13th and 14th Amendment, and from then on, are one's amendments or articles that don't have brackets around the numbers. This is critical, guys. House.gov is saying, the legislative body for the United States Corporation is saying, they don't, because this is what brackets mean. Brackets means they don't have to, it's not a part of, it's omitted. So when you're looking at the document, you better omit omit, meaning remove in your mind, 1 through 12. But we're going to, in a very sinister fashion, we're going to make you think that they're still there because most people in the United States are too dumb to realize what brackets actually mean. 
So when you're looking at the Constitution on House.gov and you see that the first 12 articles are in brackets, oh my goodness, 